Good day, everyone. My name is Rebecca Lilly for the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Quantifying the Role of Midstream Congestion and Market Structure in Permian Flaring. We're grateful to our speakers uh, and uh, for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The profession uh, organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services you can find at our website at www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for the panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated time at the end of this webinar to read and answer them. And now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Was Blundell, Assistant Professor at the School of Economic Sciences at Washington State University. Wes, over to you. All right. Today I'll be presenting Quantifying the Role of Midstream Congestion in Market Structure and Permian Flaring. This is joint work with Mark Agerton at UC Davis, Ben Gilbert at Colorado School of Mines, and Greg Upton at Louisiana State University. So flaring is the process of burning excess natural gas that occurs as a byproduct in the oil extraction process. And in the United States, there is a lot of it. In 2018, the total of flared or vented gas in the US could have powered over 6 million homes. Not only is this a problem in the US, it's a problem globally. In 2019, global flaring contributed more to greenhouse gas emissions than the entire United Kingdom. Now, it should be noted that flaring often occurs in conjunction with the leakage of methane, which has a heating potential 85 times more potent than CO2. Uh, this is often due to incomplete combustion of the natural gas during the flaring process. This is why many of the discussions around flaring also mention math also mentioned methane, as you can see in the graphic on the bottom right. As you can imagine, there are a number of costs associated from flaring. There's the climate costs from the methane and CO2 emissions. There's the lost market value of the gas itself. It could have been used to generate electricity. And finally, there are human health costs from flaring's associated local pollutants. Contaminants within the gas when burned during the flaring process can create particulate matter, which is known to be harmful to human health. So given all these costs, there have been significant policy efforts to reduce flaring. Within the United States, there's been North Dakota Order 24665 at the state level, and federally, there have been recent rule changes by the Bureau of Land Management to, cur to curb flaring and methane emissions. Globally, the most prominent policy is the World Bank Zero Routine Flaring by 2030 initiative. Uh, but despite these policy efforts, flaring remains a complicated and unresolved issue, as this graphic on the bottom of the slide will help to illustrate. So here we have North Dakota's monthly natural gas production and flaring uh, for the past decade. Now, Order 24665 mandated a reduction in the rate of natural gas flaring, which is the solid reddish brown line um, here. Now, the policy did succeed in that goal after the implementation of the policy in 2014, the rate of natural gas flaring dropped. Despite this though, the overall level of flaring, the pink shading continued to increase up till 2019. So to better understand the contributing factors to recent increases in flaring, here I have an overview of the supply chain of natural gas. So gas is extracted at individual well sites and has to travel via gathering lines to a processing facility that will strip the raw gas of its contaminants before that gas is placed on a transmission line that brings it to a distribution network connected to final consumers, such as electric utilities. Uh, as you can see, it is not immediately clear what may be the dominant supply chain factor that explains recent increases in flaring. In fact, this was the case for executives from 140 oil 146 oil and gas firms pulled by the Dallas Fed in 2019. Respondents were asked for the for reasons for an increase in flaring. And as you can see, the results were mixed. The majority of respondents did cite lack of pipeline takeaway capacity or lack of transmission capacity. 
However, roughly half also mentioned lack of gathering and natural gas processing capacity, as well as market factors such as the processing and transportation fees uh, charged by midstream operators exceeding the value of the gas itself. Bringing this back to methane, recent work indicates that infrastructure in the supply chain of natural gas is also prominent in explaining recent increases in methane emissions. That is, abnormal conditions in the midstream of the supply chain may be leading to super methane emitting events. And so these methane emitting events are associated with both old and new infrastructure, as well as infrastructure at different points in the supply chain. So with all that background, in this paper, we ask, what is the effect of midstream infrastructure congestion on flaring and methane emissions? That is, what is the effect of transmission lines? What is the effect of processing capacity? Uh, specifically, we asked to what extent does congestion in, in these different parts of the, uh, or sorry, uh, what, to what extent does congestion in infrastructure explain increased emissions? In addition, we ask whether flaring and methane emissions are substitutes or complements. Is it always the case that a reduction in flaring will correspond with a reduction in methane emissions? Finally, we ask what is the effect of market concentration among midstream? operators. Now, what we have with the paper so far uh, today, we, we're going to show estimates for the impact of transmission pipeline capacity on flaring. We also estimate the short run relationship between variation in processing capacity and flaring. We also estimate correlations between midstream market structure and well-level flaring. Our findings so far indicate evidence that lack of transmission capacity has a significant impact on flaring in the Permian. We also provide evidence of pollution substitution between flaring and methane leakage with respect to transmission capacity. We also find that lack of natural gas processing capacity explains only a small portion of observed flaring. And finally, we provide suggestive evidence that vertical integration in the midstream matters for flaring. These results contribute to three literatures. The first is the rich literature on energy transmission, which so far has primarily focused on electricity transmission. Our results also contribute to the literature on pollution substitution and our finding of infrastructure-based pollution substitution between flaring and methane is novel as this literature has primarily focused on regulation-induced pollution substitution. That is, if you regulate for uh, clean air, firms might substitute to polluting the water. Here we have, instead of regulation, infrastructure-induced substitution. Finally, we contribute to a growing literature on the determinants of flaring, where our results add to this literature by quantifying the role of two separate components in the supply chain, transmission capacity and natural gas processing capacity. So our analysis is going to make use of five data sources, the most prominent of which is the Texas Railroad Commission data that contains data such as well month level oil production, natural gas production and flaring, as well as operator characteristics, and field and well location characteristics. We also make use of the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS, database, which contains daily nighttime data of light in the Permian that is processed to represent flaring. We also make use of historical capacity at the pipeline level. This can, means we have daily volumes and operational capacity for interstate pipelines, as well as notices of major maintenance events for these pipelines. We also incorporate gas processing data, including the locations, names, and historical capacity of gas processing plants, as well as notices of flow orders, cap capacity constraint, or force majeure events for nomination points matched with these processing plants. Finally, for methane data, we make use of the tropospheric monitoring instrument or TROPOMI satellite database, which contains daily data of methane readings over the Permian. And so I just want to give a quick overview of our pipeline data. So we're, our data focuses on four major interstate pipelines from Woodmac and Genscape, the El Paso Natural Gas, Natural Gas Pipeline, uh, America, North, Northern Natural Gas, and Transwestern. The blue triangles are going to be the net receipt points, that is, uh, points where gas is being placed on the pipeline that we have data for. And it balances out with the orange dot, the export points. And it's, again, these receipt points that we're going to be matching to natural gas processing plants as well. And there are quite a number of these natural gas processing plants in the Permian. 
Uh, so far, we have matched about 27 of them, the blue dots. The red dots are the natural gas processing plants we have yet to match. And the shading, of course, here delineates, or delineates the different parts of the Permian Basin. So here, again, the blue dots are the ones that we have matched to receipt points on the pipeline network. And those are going to be the ones we're focusing on for our natural gas processing analysis you see later. So to start, what is the role of transmission pipelines? Well, we're going to first use an event study framework. That is, we're going to be focusing on single day pipeline, unplanned, major, or critical maintenance events. And so our outcome YIT is the outcome for an entity, pipeline, plant, et cetera, on that day T. And we're going to be focusing specifically on the week around these individual maintenance events. So three days prior, the day of, and three days post. And because this is an event study framework, we're going to be normalizing with respect to the day prior to the event. And here, XIT prime is going to contain our additional controls, as well as the constants of time trends, uh, entity fixed effects, and then uh, epsilon IT is the uh, error term. Uh, this framework should yield very short-term estimates of the impact of transmission capacity. That is, you can imagine within this narrow time period, the actual day of the event is random, which means these estimates are going to be internally valid, although you might argue if these events occur more, or more often during certain times of the year, our results are more applicable to just that time of the year. Uh, and so before I actually show the results, I do want to give you a better idea of what these events are. Uh, here's just one description. Northern will be conducting pipeline maintenance near the Strawberry Texas Compressor Station. Northern will not sell any primary firm capacity from May 6th to 23rd, 2014, and the operational capacity of the point will be zero. So that's just one. Uh, to give you sort of a keyword frequency in these events, uh, the majority will cite uh, issues at a compressor station or near a compressor station, but separate from those that do not mention compressor stations, about 10% mention line replacement and another 5% mention line pigging. And then another roughly, I would say seven or 8% will specify maintenance, but will not, uh, but it's not maintenance related to either compressor station or line. And then roughly 30% don't fall into either of these previous categories. So here's our first results. We're just going to look at reported operational capacity for the whole pipeline system on that on the event day, so the system for that specific pipeline. Uh, this is a very rough measure. There's very little variation in it. And yet on the day of the maintenance event, you can see there is a drop, though not statistically significant, in that reported operational capacity, consistent with the idea these uh, events are impacting transmission capacity. Uh, but again, R squared is 0 0.967. So I think you could argue in this case with this rough outcome measure, statistical significance is uh, not necessarily expected. However, we do believe that this is still good or this is helps motivate our use of these events for looking at the effect or changes in transmission capacity on flaring and methane, which is what we do here using that same event study framework now, looking at these event windows around maintenance events. In the top left panel, we have the log of daily flaring over the Permian. And as you can see on those days, there's a statistically significant increase in flaring. And in the top right panel, we have the log of methane readings over the Permian. And as you can see, following the day of the maintenance event, day zero, on day one, there's a statistically significant decrease in methane emissions. Now, our sort of story for why there's this disparity in timing is that you might imagine when there's a shutdown in transmission capacity, well, the gas can't leave the natural gas processing facility, and there's not the gas can't, if there's congestion further back in the system now, gas can't travel from the well, so it's flared at all the points prior to the transmission line, and so that's why we observe an increase in flaring. But then the next day, because these are single day maintenance events, well, because there's not as much gas in the system, it was all flared the day prior, there's now less gas leaking on the transmission line at those compressor stations, et cetera. And so that's why we observe a statistically significant decrease in methane emissions. Now, if you don't like our story or our focus on um, that, that specific timing story or our focus on these single day events, well, if we have 
aggregate to the week level and include those multiple day maintenance events. Uh, the picture is much more precise. On the bottom left panel, we have a statistically significant increase in flaring the week of the maintenance event, but on the weeks prior or the weeks post, there's no statistically distinguishable change in flaring. And on the bottom right panel, you can see on the week of the maintenance event, there is a statistically significant decrease in methane emissions, but there's no differential change in methane emissions prior, uh, as compared to the baseline in the weeks prior or the weeks post. Now, the problem with this analysis is that it only considers interstate transmission lines. It's difficult to obtain data on utilization and operational capacity for intrastate pipelines, which I believe make up, makes up about a third of the transmission of all natural gas within the Permian. So to proxy for congestion on all transmission lines, we're going to use the gas price differential between the Henry Hub in Louisiana and the Waha Hub in Texas. The idea being that if there are higher comparative prices in Louisiana uh, as compared to Texas, then there must be significant congestion in transporting natural gas out of Texas. Otherwise, individuals would be trying to arbitrage by transporting the gas out of Texas where it's getting a low price to Louisiana where at the Henry Hub where it would receive a higher price. And so to instrument for this daily price differential, our proxy for overall transmission congestion, we use the count of these major or critical maintenance events use uh, for pipelines in Texas on that day, the maintenance events you saw on the previous slide. That is, we're meeting the exclusion restriction for a two-stage le lease, for, sorry, two-stage lease squares framework if you believe these major or critical pipeline maintenance events only impact flaring through their impact on available transmission capacity. And here is just a quick time series plot to sort of further motivate this idea of the price differential being a good proxy for congestion. So on the red line, we have over, uh, utilization on interstate pipelines. So the percent of reported capacity being used and the blue line is the Henry Hub Waha price differential. As you can see, periods with a high price differential correspond with a high rate of utilization. That is, there's less capacity to transport the gas out of the Permian. And time periods that correspond with a low price differential correspond with lower utilization, corresponds with more uh, transmission capacity being available to transport natural gas out of the Permian. Now, here are the results from that two-stage least squares framework. Uh, as you can see in all four specifications, the first stage is um, rather strong, statistically significant at the 1% level. And I believe all of our F stats are above 10, which is the barometer for first stage, a uh, strong first stage. Now in columns one and three, the outcome in the second stage is the log of flaring. As you can see, higher price differential, higher congestion in transmission capacity, or sorry, higher congestion in transmission corresponds with an increase in flaring. Now columns two and four show methane emissions. And although it's negative indicating that increased uh, or decreased transmission capacity corresponds with a decrease in methane emissions, these results are not statistically significant. You might believe that's because there's differential in how methane leaks at different points in the supply chain, or it's due to the fact that we're still working on expanding the number of observations as the time period we currently have for methane readings is much smaller than what we have for uh, flaring readings from the VIRS database. So that was all of our results with transmission capacity. But there's another piece, natural gas processing capacity. And so to evaluate the importance of natural gas processing capacity, we use quasi-experimental variation from unplanned force majeure or operational flow order events that reduce output from a plant. So one example of this, force majeure notice text one, update one, that's the actual what it says, Northern is currently experiencing underperformance at the following field area receipt points. And then it goes on to list a number of receipt points and a number of natural gas plants, including the Target Benedum plant, which is one that we've matched, one of those blue triangles you saw earlier. Uh, and then it goes on to say, Northern will be required to allocate and curtail the underperforming receipt points to actual flowing volumes. So for those that don't explicitly list a plant name, we'd match these events based on if the plant name appears, in, or sorry, we also match these events based on whether the PIN or POI matches the receipt meter for the plant. Uh, and so 
what we're going to do for a well level analysis is we match wells to natural gas plants according to whether that natural gas plant is the closest to be a gathering line distance. And then we use these events tied to these plants to look and see what happens for well level flaring. Uh, and one key difference between these events and the previous ones is there's no clear end date. It's not like I can say these are multiple day or single day events. The end dates that are put into this data set are like 2099 sometimes. So uh, it's not really, a, you, we don't really have, I would say, a trustworthy measure of how long these events are supposed to last. And yet, even with an event study framework where we look at the day level output or what is processed by the plant, we can see that following the event in question, there's a statistically, on the day of the event and the days following, there's a statistically significant decrease in output. So these force majeure plant uh, events tied to the nomination points do correspond with a decrease in uh, at least what the plant is able to process, an indication that there is a decrease in processing capacity. And as you might imagine, although it's rather noisy, that's what happens when you cut up the satellite data into smaller and smaller squares, there is a statistically significant increase in flaring 30 kilometers around the plant um, at the month level. And even at the month level, we still have a statistically significant decrease in overall output from the plant. And so it's this third panel right here, the month level output or what is processed by the plant. Uh, this estimate is going to be used to construct an upper bound for the elasticity between processing capacity and flaring. And I'll get to why this negative 0.23 in this final figure, or in this third figure here, is going to be giving us an upper bound. But key thing, these events we're using correspond with decreases in output by the plant, increase in flaring around the plant. But again, we're tying this to the well level. That is, we're going to be taking our Texas Railroad Commission data. We're going to be look at the log of flaring at well I in month T with respect to whether the plant we believe that well is connected to closest via gathering line distance has one of these force majeure operational flow order notices. And we're going to be including a bunch of fixed effects, plant fixed effects, um, well year fixed effects, um, month dummies, et cetera. And so identification here stems from the assumption that these plant events are unrelated to an individual's well, individual well's short-term characteristics. Uh, that means, and again, the use of well year fixed effects allows for the comparison of the same well connected to the same plant within the year. So you might imagine that, um, you know, the variation to some extent is within that one year, which month that there's an event at the plant the well is connected to might be random. And so that's where our argument of quasi-random comes from, is that with all these fixed effects, months fix, month fixed effects, well, year fixed effects, um, within that time frame, that very, or that very narrow set of variation, it's plausibly exogenous when the notice actually occurs at that plant. Uh, and so with that, here are our results. The processing notice uh, corresponds with an increase in flaring in all of our specifications. And so our final specification, our per preferred specification, column four, which includes all the fixed effects, um, statistically significant at the 10% level, indicates that one of these processing notices corresponds with a 14.2% increase in flaring. Um, now, this is not perfect. Again, this gives us what we believe to be an upper bound on the elasticity between natural gas processing capacity and flaring. To get a lower bound, we use a different source of variation. That is just actual reported expansions in the natural gas processing uh, plant. So, sorry, uh, expansions, yeah, in the natural gas processing plant's capacity. And so on average, these expansions increase capacity by 115%. And uh, as somewhat indicated by our event study framework, there does appear to be a drop 30 km in, flare, in the log of flaring 30 kilometers around the plant in the month of the expansion, although this is not statistically significant. Part of this is due to the nature of how it's reported in that it's at the month level, not the day level. And what I believe is going on is they report the operational increase um, if that increase occurs at some point in the month, not for the entire month. So it's not probably not 115%, it's probably somewhere less than 115% because again, that 
increase in operational capacity is probably not applicable for the entire first month. With that said, though, we do find in the majority of our specifications, these expansions correspond with a large and statistically significant decrease in well level flaring for the wells we believe are connected to these plants. Uh, and so because of that nature of how it's reported and that it's the month level and the actual expansion occurs within the month, we believe this route is going to give us the lower bound for the relationship between processing capacity and flaring. So let's do some back of the envelopes now. Let's do our horse race to see what part of this supply chain actually matters for explaining the increase in flaring. So going back to our IV estimates with uh, transmission capacity, our two-stage least squares estimates would indicate that reducing transmission constraints such that the average Henry Hub Waha price differential became zero, no congestion in transmission of natural gas out of the Permian. This would correspond with a 44% decrease in flaring. And we should note this number represents both the elimination of transmission capacity as well as the exertion of market power in the market for uh, natural gas transmission. Next, using the same two stage least squares estimates, we uh, find that reducing transmission constraints such that the average Henry Hub Waha price differential became zero would correspond with a 30% increase in methane emissions. So substitution from flaring toward methane emissions. And so what this does is overall, uh, climate costs would decrease if there was no uh, congestion in transmission, but that decrease is only 91 million USD because climate costs from increased methane emissions, uh, there would be a $148 million increase in climate costs from methane emissions uh, versus the $239 million climate costs that are being offset by reduced flaring. And again, these same calculations assume the total number of wells and the amount of gas extracted would remain the same. Uh, now, for what the importance of natural gas processing plant capacity. So the first identification strategy we used were those force majeure events, which said that estimated plant output drops by 0 0.233. And these events all co also correspond with 0 0.142 increase in flaring. That gives us an elasticity between natural gas processing capacity and flaring of 0 0.63, multiplying that by the percentage of flaring from wells that are actually connected to plants. We get uh, that at most processing capacity can explain 39% of flaring. And again, this is an upper bound because the actual amount that processing capacity would have decreased has to be more than 23%. That is output decreases by 23%. The act processing capacity must have decreased by more than 23%. Um, now, for the other identification strategy, using just the reported operational capacity, um, which was 115%, versus that well-level estimate of these expansions decreased flaring by 0 0.544, we get an implied elasticity of 0 0.47, which means our lower bound for how much natural gas processing capacity can explain flaring is 29%. Uh, and again, these calculations assume the total number of wells and the amount of gas extracted would remain the same. So this is the infrastructure picture. But if you recall that Dallas Fed poll that I cited at the beginning to motivate this, there were also market concerns, things like the market, uh, the cost of transporting and processing the gas exceeding the market value of the gas itself. And so here we have some suggestive correlations for how much market structure might matter. And so we're going to be taking those force majeure or operational flow order events, and we're gonna be interacting them with whether the well is vertically integrated with the natural gas processing plant. I see there's one thing in the chat window. If it's a question, could you put it in the Q&A? Um, and so if they have the same parent company, sorry, let me back that up. We're gonna be integrating the, sorry, interacting these notices with whether the plant has the same parent company as the well in question. And as you can see, that matters, corresponds with a relative decrease in how much these processing notices increase well level flaring. But not only that, if we just interact these notices with what share of the natural gas for all of the wells that are connected to that plant does that operator have, we can see that also the relative size of the operator compared to the other operators at wells connected to that plant seems to correspond with a 
negative correlation in flaring when these events occur. And so this is suggestive of a few things. It's suggestive either that somehow these well operators that are vertically integrated with the plants must have better technology, or there's a difference in, sorry, um, contract structure. That is, they are getting some type of priority or some type of better deal that makes them less likely to flare when there's reduced capacity. Um, so again, these results suggest that the midstream market structure may matter as well, not just the overall level of transmission or natural gas processing capacity, that is gathering contract structure, comp capacity prioritization, may be driving those correlations you saw. Um, we're currently working on expanding this type of analysis. That is, we're looking to consider spatial measures in midstream competition. That is, number of natural gas plants or interstate transmission lines within 30 kilometers of the well. How does that matter for well level reported flaring? We're also working on expanding our analysis regarding methane emissions. That is, we want to separately identify a meth methane emissions at different points in the supply chain for natural gas, well level, natural gas plant. Um, as well as transmission line uh, leakage. And so this will allow us to provide, or this will provide us a richer understanding of the nature of emissions substitution in the supply chain of natural gas. Uh, so with all of that, what are the policy implications? Well, policies that subsidize, I, I guess, policies that subsidize processing or transmission capacity may not have significant benefits. There's an indication from the suggestive correlations at the end that our results uh, or that market structure may matter. Uh, and also that methane and flaring emission substitution may reduce the benefits of processing or additional processing or transmission capacity. And, meaning, and finally, it should be noted that subsidizing infrastructure may make it more difficult to meet long run climate goals. That is, it may make it more difficult to switch away from fossil fuels in the future. Um, our results do indicate, though, that during our sample time frame, there was infra insufficient infrastructure to prevent flaring. And so potential policies that incentivize development in areas with sufficient infrastructure or more competitive market structure in the midstream may be optimal for reducing flaring, you know, uh, changing the profile of methane emissions. Uh, and also, you might imagine restrictions on the types of contracts in midstream or transmission may matter as well here as indicated by those vertical or by that interaction on vertical integration in those force measure events. So overall though, future work should examine optimal policy when faced with emission substitution, market structure, and long-term infrastructure investment. So with that, our conclusions, we investigate the role of constraints in the supply chain of natural gas production on flaring. We document that transmission capacity constraints have a significant impact on flaring. We find that natural gas processing capacity constraints have a smaller impact on flaring. We find that lack of transmission capacity leads to substitution from methane leakage to well flaring. We also provide suggestive evidence that vertical integration with midstream processing as well as firm size correlate with decreased flaring under reduced processing capacity. These results help to address a current lack of economic studies on the, recent for, on the reasons for flaring which is an important policy issue both in the U.S. and globally as shale oil and gas production has boomed over the last de two decades. And so with that, um, appreciate any questions or comments you may have, and thank you for attending. So I think I, there's two here. Okay, so Tim, elasticity calculations hold upstream quantity constant. I don't think we've done that as a control. So that would be like the daily fracking activity that we can do, or sorry, daily. Yeah, we have different measures for daily activity. Um, I'm not sure what, maybe Mark has a better answer or Mark or Ben or Greg, but I'm not sure what cost data we have at the day or month level. That's a good point. Um, so what is the basis of increased methane emissions associated with reduced flaring? Is this the entire... Um, so I would think it's, we've been talking about this as well. The story that I'm arguing is that uh, the incomplete combustion at the well site 
is less important than these super methane emitting events at uh, compressor stations on the transmission system. That is, uh, if there's more flaring at the well, yes, there's more methane emissions at the well, but that is less than the methane emissions than if the gas were put further down the um, further down the supply chain down to transmission lines where it's more likely to, I think we had that, this is from another paper. You're not supposed to use evidence from another paper to argue for results in your paper, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, more likely to come out at these compressor stations. And so that's why we have this differential. But again, it's also why we're trying to focus on breaking up methane emissions at different points in the supply chain, because this is all just, you know, speculation until we actually have better data distinguishing methane emissions from compressor stations or by transmission lines than at, say, the well level due to incomplete combustion of the natural gas. So, so Wes, kind of related to that, have we done any back of the envelopes as of what's the social cost versus the private cost? So you know the value of the gas, you know how much increased in flaring that there was, and you know, suppose that you could have sold that at Henry Hub, for instance, that there wasn't, um, you know, all these constraints. And is the social cost, you know, some tiny fraction of that private cost, or is it is it a large portion? Do so I know? used um, I used the two dollar and seventy cents from. Let's go to this here. I used the two dollars and seventy cents for thousand cubic feet of natural gas. Um, so that helps give the 239 million. So I think the price of gas was during our sample time frame about four fifty five dollars, if I'm not mistaken. So I would think it's double, right? Mm -hmm. Unless I'm misremembering what the price of a thousand cubic feet of gas in the 2018 to 2000 or 2016 to 2021 time period was. So that two thirty nine million that that's only social cost though. Yes, you would have to that's double the two dollars and seventy cents. Cost. Yes, yeah, gotcha. And then you would also, when you're losing the methane though, you would also again there would be a private cost associated with that, but you're going to lose less of it. But the yep. social cost per unit of methane is way higher than the flaring. Yeah, I use the I use the number from your REIT paper, the twenty eight eighty nine on this one here. Gotcha. So, yeah. Um, okay, Tim. Okay, so let's we'll compare competitiveness of midstream in the Permian to other plays. Oh, that's a good point. I think. That's a really, so first I'm gonna address the easy part first, Tim, by saying that I really like the idea of using the a growth rate or recent growth rate as a control because definitely that's gonna matter is how quickly that particular field or play has ramped up in production. Um, and so in terms of comparing competitiveness of midstream in the Permian versus other plays, um, it is possible to incorporate the Bakken. And I think that's a good point of, because the Bakken would be cleaner on a number of dimensions. And so having comparisons over time and within fields or and across plays would definitely give a much cleaner answer in terms of uh, the importance of market structure. If we're gonna limit ourselves to just staying within the Permian though, um, We'd be curious to know your thoughts on how good variation in the competitive structure of these 30 kilometer circles uh, over time would be. That is, we just broke up the Permian into a set of hexagons. And then we compared the importance of these events with like these uh, force majeure events for plants within those hexagons um, over time as the competitive structure changed. So additional plants came in or came out or the overall um, output or production changed. Uh, how convincing would that be in terms of getting at how much market structure matters? 
uh, as well. So I, I get that probably you're right, that it's ideal to compare, say, Permian to Bakken, but we're trying to stick within just the Permian. Wes, I was going to put. Oh, uh, I was going to push on something that that Mark had put in the Q and A about sort of how we think about the short run versus the long run. So all these estimates are pretty much short run, and it strikes me that a lot of this methane versus flaring substitution depends on the expectations, right? If you get a signal that there's going to be a, a pipeline shutdown, then you can plan to flare off what you couldn't have sent through the pipe, whereas your expectations for long run capacity might be different and affect your decisions differently. So I wonder if you've thought about that. Um, I think that ultimately we're probably giving it, our short run estimates are an upper bound because I would think on the margin, there is some money to be gained if you can manage to get the gas processed. Um, and so on the margin, I would think some wells are not going to be drilled if they anticipate insufficient infrastructure and natural gas processing or transmission. Uh, that's just my my quick intuition on this is uh, in the lo long run estimates, the just intermittency, random shutdowns or you know maintenance events that would have occurred no matter what are going to matter more. And these... Uh, Infra overall infrastructure matters less because the decision to drill or refrack or connect is completely endogenous to that expectation. So Wes, have, can we get a uh, social cost and private cost per maintenance outage event? Like, so say like for one individual event on average, this is the social cost of that event and this is the private cost of that event. And essentially do a back of the envelope if you were to you know, assess a, a Pagovian tax on these events that occur, what would that, you know, what would that tax look like? Um, so I think we can, I, I would trust more the uh, month level if we're doing the force majeure events, right? Because then we have the actual reported thousand cubic feet of natural gas flared versus produced at the well level. And so the calculation is very, very, very clean. Mm -hmm. As we're talking our day level, um, we're talking our day level transmission events. Well, then we have to make a stand on how we're going to translate Veer's flaring readings at the day level um, to cubic feet at the day level when our cubic feet of production are, and well, cubic feet of flared are month level measures, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how at we want to- level, it would be pretty straightforward to get a per- Extremely, yeah. Event, okay. Yeah. Because you just take the total and then divide by number of events that we have, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Okay. Oh, another question. Wes, let me just throw this out there. As we think about like policies that are um, targeted, at, if we're a policy, say, say we're the EPA and we've got this choice between limiting, or the, we're the RRC and we have a choice between limiting flaring and limiting methane emissions, how does what we're doing kind of uh, provide some guidance as to what the priority is if we're thinking about policy um, and trying to maximize, you know, we, we get one policy and we've got these two problems. What do we go for, you know? Well, I think, um, uh, first of all, I think we have to avoid the cheeky answer of, well, we can avoid flaring by just venting. Um, right. But besides that, 
uh, going back to this, I think this th this is, I think, the most troubling. And, uh, you know, it says right here that we would gain more in terms of climate benefit if we reduced flaring. But I think the question, as uh, the people asking questions sort of indicated, this entirely depends on holding total production or output constant and where this methane emissions are occurring within the supply chain, right? But clearly 239 million is greater than 148 million, but mm -hmm. this is additional on what? I think that's that's the question that has to be answered. Um, yeah, I mean, and we see like a lot of, and, and this is me maybe more just speculating about a lot of people being angry about building new pipelines and kind of a keep it in the ground strategies has moved towards protesting pipelines. We think about like the Keystone XL debacle. Um, are our results in some level uh, saying, hey, you're actually hurting the environment if we stop these pipelines or um, maybe in the short run you'd hurt the environment, but in the long run, you know, we'd, we'd get less leakage, less pressures. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, these results, at least the 239 million is suggested that it's preferred that the gas get transported to market um, rather than be flared at the well. And this is also ignoring efficiency considerations of if you make natural gas cheaper, you might be displacing coal, which has a better climate benefit depending on where you, how you consider switching costs in the long term. Um, so at some level, we're kind of, these results are fairly pro-pipeline in terms of environmental benefits. Am I overstating that? Uh, I mean, as these results stand now, you know, it's kind of <laughs> on what, yeah, they're somewhat pro-pipeline in the sense that, um, but again, we're not including the cost of the pipeline necessarily. No, I know I, I, no, for sure. Your mark. <laughs> no, you know, I know I'm like pushing you to make big generalizations that are that are far outside the scope of what, you know, if, if standard errors make us uncomfortable, then this this question should just make us tear our hair out. But, but uh, I think it's no, an interesting I, the, kind the of standard errors make me uncomfortable because it's like, oh, yeah, we got to incorporate all that serial correlation over time since we're doing a whole bunch of time series stuff. So it's not as simple as, you know, I'm presenting a, a paper where treatment is at the plant level. And so we're just going to cluster at the plant and be done. <laughs> but yeah. Um, no, uh, I want to answer Tim's question though. So, so impact forecast impact of different flaring policies. So that is no routine flaring. Um, must have a plan like North Dakota's imposed flaring limits. So yeah, I think that very simply, probably if we get a really good number in terms of the substitution between methane versus flaring, then I think that's just applicable pretty much to, um, you know, a lot of this no routine flaring policy in the sense that probably the U.S. represents an ideal case of the substitution between flaring and methane emissions. And so you can kind of get an estimate for what the if you have an estimate for how much flaring is reduced in the climate cost, well, then we can also say, but methane costs would increase by this amount according to our substitution estimate. But again, that's conditional on where this methane emissions is occurring and also what happens when we better control for output or as you put growth. So I think that's the, the immediate thing that comes to mind for how we could use these estimates of forecast impact of different flaring policies certainly I think the substitution number matters for those benefits. Um, yeah. I think Tim has another question, Wes. Yeah. So pro pipeline point, what do beers data show about as a function of pipeline age? Um, that we can do. I think that's a good, because Mark, we have pipeline age. Right, so we could just do an interaction between the age of the pipelines and how much these events matter. I think that. 
Yeah, I, you know, we've got four interstate transmission lines. I don't know how much we're able to track when this section was built versus that section. And I, I don't know if, you know, I'm not we sure what the relevant. At, do we have capacity at the section level, at least at the month section level? Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure here. Yeah, I try and figure um, out. And you know, the, 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 well. <laughs> the big unknown here is the intrastate pipelines, um, which are not regulated by FERC. Um, and so I'm not sure if the RRC does all the safety regulations or if that's FEMSA. Um, so Texas is tough because there's all the interstate pipelines. And I, I would think someplace like North Dakota, which doesn't, doesn't have near as much market for the gas and kind of has to ship it out, might be a little easier to, uh, to address that sort of uh, a comment. But it's a, it, you know it's a good it's a good question and it's it's one about pipeline safety, um, so I think yeah, it's important. No, I think it. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I just you're right. I think I think we could do at least a rough. We have rough proxies for ages of the section of the pipeline, I believe. So we could do like uh, years since there was a change in that pipeline's that segment's reported capacity versus an event on it in some way to at least get at how much age might matter. Um, yeah. I think we have to be a little bit careful in casting these results as saying that the policy implication is that we should build more pipelines. I mean, I just don't think we can say that. So what we can say is that our results suggest that in this period, if we had had more capacity, there would have been a net climate benefit. But going forward, if we were to build more pipelines, it would probably produce a net climate benefit over some window of time, but it would also reduce the cost of remaining on fossil fuels for a longer period of time. And we, we can't say whether that helps us over the meet, you know, 2050 or 2100 climate goals. Completely agree. Yeah, and I think we are certainly limited in the sense that we are we have short run numbers. It's very hard for us to think about like, what does a long run production elasticity look like? Or um, how do we think about plant entry uh, or pipeline entry? You know, I think, I think those are just very, uh, we, getting daily, <laughs> daily variation and flaring, it, it makes it hard to kind of- If we're talking about pipeline or plant entry, do you think there are network externalities that need to be considered? <laughs> Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Oh, good. All right. This is a lot of good stuff. Thank you. And Tim, uh, thank you for all your comments. These are super helpful. Yeah, thank you, Tim. All right. Oh, do we have another? Yeah, of course. All right, I think we finished. Would you like seven, me to wrap things up? Yeah, I think, I think we've lost momentum here. Excellent, well, thank you so much. Um, this was an outstanding webinar. This webinar will be available on IAEE's website for future download. If you're not a member, we encourage you to join by visiting www.iaee.org. We thank you for attending and I officially close this webinar.